Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good Thank morning. you. Oh. It's not like I want hecklers, but a little feedback's all right. <laughs> um, welcome. Thank you for the Lord's providence to bring us all here today. This is a beautiful break in the weather. So some of us are visiting from Phoenix, but even for those of us who are local, this 68 degrees and little drizzly feels very really nice. I did not expect in March that I'd be waiting for uh, the heat to go away, but here I am excited about that. I'd like to acknowledge the ladies. Pretty much every lady in this church has worked hard to make what we now see when we walk in look so much better. So a round of applause, however that looks. Thank you, ladies. Um, I know we had to twist a lot of arms to get you to go to Hobby Lobby and hang out and have lunch together, but you were willing servants, and we appreciate that, and it does look amazing in here. Um, a couple of announcements. Rummage Sale Part 2, the sequel, will be September 30th, and we will be doing the same thing, but hopefully less smoke. Hopefully the wind won't blow our signs down. Hopefully we'll get a little bit more time to get some signage out there, and we will be able to have another rummage sale. It was a great time. If you have nothing to sell, if you feel there's nothing to do, come hang out. It was a really neat time to hang out. Also, uh, of course, we have the do-it-yourself nursery. I don't see any babies in need of that. But there you go. And just so we're clear, the babies, you don't do it yourselves. The moms will do it. Um, Couples Night Out is coming up September 15th. That'll be here. That's a Friday night. It's going to be put on by Pastor Ray Durham from Duran from Freedom Fellowship. And he runs kind of marriage counseling and conferences. And it's kind of his little thing he likes to do. So he'll have that going on. And then, as you all know, next Sunday will be our fellowship meal, our potluck and communion. We do that once a month. And so because of the holiday this weekend, we push that aside. So that'll be next week. Let's begin our worship with a little bit of a prayer here. Let's acknowledge the families that are here and missing and open our hearts and our minds to the Lord. Our gracious Father. We're grateful for your blessing in our lives, just for bringing us here together in your glory, in your providence. We thank you for this last hurrah of summer, for families to get together before we settle into the school year. We lift up this new school year for the teachers that'll be getting a new crop of kids and training and exhorting and modeling godly behavior. Lord God, we pray for the many families who homeschool pray that you will give them strength and wisdom and patience and long-suffering, Lord God. We know these families sacrifice a lot, second incomes often, Lord God, and how they, um, they spend their time raising their children in the way they should go, and we're eternally grateful for that, Lord God. We know that will pay dividends, and we pray for your blessing and your hand on those families as it is a truly noble task, but it is tiring and it is not always fun. So we just thank you, Lord God, for the family that we have here in this church, this body, this congregation, that we will be in each other's lives. We will love one another as you've called us to, and they will always seek to honor you in all our ways. Bless us as our hearts as we open up into a time of worship, Lord God, to sing praises to your name and to hear your word preached. Amen. All right, church, we're going to ask you to stand and sing with us as we begin our, our singing to God. Amazing grace. That's all we know really well.
Be seated. You might notice we did not start with a psalm reading. Trying something a little bit different this morning. A little bit of a word of encouragement is what we're calling it. So if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 32. Let's look at that. Psalm 32. A masculine of David. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up by the heat of the summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. This passage kind of encapsulates so much of how we feel and experience life as Christians, right? So we look at these first five verses. We see that we are blessed not just to be forgiven of our sins, but honestly to be found out in our sin. It says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. It says in verse 3, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through the groaning all day long. Have you ever been in your sin? Have you ever been so mired in your sin, you know you are at odds with your brothers and sisters, with God? We know when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us. We know the trappings of this world can come in, whether it's normal stuff, just day-to-day being focused on work and finances and having a, a healthy family, which are all good things, right? But also we can... Let sin creep into our lives, whether it's bitterness, whether it's anger, frustration, or worse. We see that Adam and Eve were made perfect, made righteous. They were naked and they were unashamed. And yet, when they sinned, they felt their shame. They felt their nakedness. This is how we are in our sin. Day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up. He says in verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. God's promise is to forgive us when we confess our sin. This is true in the Psalms, the Psalm most likely written by David, and it's true throughout the New Testament, and it's true today. Confess your sin to the Lord, and he will forgive you. This is God's providence on those he loves. He does not leave us in our sin. He will leave the 99 to follow the one. The Lord will forgive our iniquities. Repent and be saved. We see here in verses 6 through 7. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. This is why we are in each other's lives daily and weekly. This is why we are the body of Christ. When someone is in iniquity, when someone is at a tough time in their life, when someone's down, when someone's overwhelmed, when someone's hurting, this is why we are here. Offer godly prayers to them. I will instruct you, verse 8, and teach you in the way you should go. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding. The stubborn the proud. This is who God does not like. This is the wicked. This is the wicked we see here. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. 
but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Don't be prideful in your life, in anything you can or do. If you are upright in heart, if you are righteous, if you are made right before God, if you are not living in unrepentant sin, but you are living, following the Lord, acknowledging him in all your paths, does the world not seem brighter? Do the troubles not seem as painful? Life is sweeter when you are in fellowship with God. This is our exhortation for us today. Blessed are those who delight in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. This is our heart's cry when we are in communion with God, when we are seeking him diligently and we are honoring him with our lips and our deeds. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word, for your promises to us. Thank you that you chase us down when we are sinning. That we, your children, do not escape your correction. By your hand, you draw us near. We know you promise to forgive us of our sin. We know you promise, Lord God, through the Son, through your Son, and through the blood that he spilt on the cross, that you will forgive us of all our iniquity. You will adopt us into your family. Thank you, Lord, that we can be made right with you and that the answer to all of our troubles is to cast our cares on you because you care for us, to lay our sin and our anxieties and our worries and our stresses at your feet, Lord God, to honor you, to worship you, to give you glory. Your word tells us that you will not withhold wisdom from those who seek it, Lord God. I pray that we'll be the kind of people and the kind of church that seeks your wisdom at every turn. You know, I pray. Amen. Thank you for that, Matt. I'm going to ask you to stand up again, maybe slightly more slowly than usual, to give Matt a chance to get his guitar back on. Come down now.
Come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. Makes the lower hands a spear and tells the wolves to cease. O mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. Let thy faith in God be burns the chariot. for this morning is 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 11 if you want to go ahead and find that in your Bibles. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 4 1 through 11. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God 
created to be received with thank thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is, is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are good. You are our God. We are not God, but you are God. You do good. You give us good things, and we give you thanks for that. Father, you, you are the one and only God, the one that we are dependent on. Your Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ, has come so that we can have forgiveness of sins and have a relationship with you. And we thank you for that, and we, we earnestly desire that, Father. May we not fall away from the faith, but instead uh, make us into the good servants that you desire us to be. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. If you haven't already, let's turn to 1 Timothy as I turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And today we're going to explore a couple of different ideas that, that go hand in hand. They, they very well could be their own sermon by themselves, but... Uh, these are, if, if you look at the, the text here, this is Timothy, sorry, this is Paul telling Timothy one thing which follows very neatly into the next. So first we're going to understand and explore an idea called apostasy, which I'll, uh, I'll define. But basically this means that uh, people that say they belong to the faith and then depart from the faith, they, they claim to be Christians, and then one day abruptly they no longer uh, call Christ as their Savior. And then, as we do that and we explore what that means, we're going to then move into the next verses, verses 6 through 11, and hopefully be encouraged by what it means to be a good servant of Christ, and in fact, hopefully be and become and remain good servants of Christ. Uh, the first two verses here, I'll read it again. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to be to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciousnesses are seared. So the Bible tells us here that there will be people, church members, uh, apparently followers of Christ, who will depart from the saving faith in Jesus Christ. And this is, the Bible clearly telling us this, it's, it's, it's very strong here. It's true that all the Bible... All of Scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it offers a great question. Who wrote Timothy here? Was it Paul or was it the Holy Spirit? And the answer is yes. It was the Holy Spirit writing through Paul, Paul writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But we come to this verse here, and uh, that, that's strengthened. It, it tells us that the Spirit express, explicitly, in some translations, or expressly says, is this is the Spirit telling us that there will some... There will be some that fall away, that no longer adhere to the faith. So with that in mind, it shouldn't be a shock when people depart from the church. But I don't know about you. To me, it has been, and it often is. Um, maybe you have lived long enough to see this, to see someone like described in the, these first two verses that will in later times depart from the faith. They, they claim to be a Christian. Maybe they were a church leader Probably they showed at least some evidence for a time of, of good fruit, of good works, of, oh wow, this, is a, this must be a, a devout follower of, of Jesus. 
you walked with them, maybe you discipled with them, maybe you were discipled by them, you had a relationship with them. And then all of a sudden, well, I don't believe anymore. What, what, what are we to make of that? What, what does that mean and for that person? What does that mean for us as a church? Uh, I, I believe I experienced this. I, I'm, not, I'm going to mention a couple of different people that I've known in, in my spiritual walk, and I don't presume to know their exact spiritual state, but just based off of what we see in the lives, I, I think I may have seen this in at least one person's life. Um, I learned a lot about God in my middle school years. Uh, back when I was growing up, as it should be, that was 7th and 8th grade, not 6th, 7th and 8th grade. That's a... It's not scriptural, but it's a problem I have with calling sixth graders middle schoolers. Um, I, I, I was a Christian before this, so this was not where I came to know Jesus, but this was a lot of how I was trained up in the Word, in, in the Gospel. Um, and we had a dynamic youth pastor. Uh, we'll call him John because that was his name. And um, John was amazing. He was full of life. He was full of enthusiasm for God. Maybe in retrospect, I might have learned more enthusiasm for God than I did actual attributes of God from him. But still, I, I, I had a love for the church and for the people and for God and for his word. John led us in Bible studies. He encouraged us to worship. He challenged us every, every time that we came together, especially on Sunday mornings, to study our Bibles, to share our faith, uh, to share with one another, what's God working, doing in your life? Where are you struggling? Where do you need help? Uh, it was very encouraging. He challenged us in every way. Um, John had a lovely wife who served with him as well. She welcomed us into her home. She taught many of the, of the young ladies' classes, 7th through 12th grade, because this was the entire uh, youth group, 7th through 12th. Just write that down. Maybe not in your Bibles, but write that down. Um, she was an important part of this ministry, and not, not that I had a great perspective, I didn't go and visit every single church, but from what I could tell, and, and when we would meet with other churches, I believe that we had maybe the, the best youth department, youth ministry, in the entire area. And a lot of that was built off, in my mind, of John. And then one day, abruptly, John left his wife for a young mistress. He abandoned her. Uh, he abandoned the church. He renounced his faith. And I don't know all the details. I was still just a kid, remember. Uh, but I know from my parents that some church leaders saw him out to, if not restore him as a youth leader in the church, to at least restore him as a brother in Christ. And he wanted nothing to do with his wife. He wanted nothing to do with the church. He wanted nothing to do with God. Uh, to the best of my recollection and whatever information I, I had at the time. And it devastated me. And I can only imagine how his wife felt. To my knowledge, John never repented, never returned to the faith. And these verses here deal with that type of a scenario, with what's happening with those that leave the faith. Now, as a very brief side point, I want to address the question that I had as a middle schooler. What, what did this mean that this person that I thought I was learning so much about God from what does this mean that he may have never been a believer? Or he is a believer, he certainly is not living that way now. Um, one thing that I came to understand is that you can learn the truth even from a source that doesn't know the truth itself. And Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18 uh, kind of speaks to that uh, to, to some degree. The, the context may be a little bit different if you look in Philippians, but uh, the, the message here is the same. And this is the passage that also used to, to baffle me. We're going to see people in these three verses that uh, preach Christ, but not because they believe and follow and love Christ. It says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter, out of goodwill, do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. It's that last verse there that used to just really gnaw at me. Um, Somebody, Paul could rejoice that somebody was preaching the gospel out of pretense, which clearly would mean that this person does not believe what he was preaching. 
You tie that back into my situation with my youth pastor. Not everything that John taught was a lie. You know, whatever the, the true state of his relationship with, with Jesus is right now, to the degree that he taught truth, God in his sovereignty was able to use that to teach me and other youth. God is sovereign enough that here in Philippians, in that, those verses that we read, we saw him use people preaching out of ambition and insincerity to share his truth. So that's how I reconciled with that. So now back to Timothy, our, our passage today. It was a shock when John left and when I've seen other people renounce their faith, which I have, because I hadn't yet learned what Paul tells Timothy here, that some will depart. It tells us they will devote themselves to lies, that this is um, a battle in the mind which we're going to struggle with, our, our minds and our hearts. Uh, people where this happens are following after deceitful spirits. And it tells us plainly here in this text that they follow after the teachings of demons. Uh, so that, that's how uh, this falling away can begin. But what does it mean when someone walks away from faith in Jesus? Well, for starters, as believers, we need to understand uh, there, there, there's a couple of warnings here. We can be deceived as, as believers. Uh, we can be uh, follow after, after lies, thinking that they are, in fact, uh, the, the gospel truth. But there is a difference between falling into error, which is something that Paul is warning about, but also true apostasy, true departing from the faith. When, what Paul is talking about here is those that leave the faith. These are people that are rebelling against God, following after the demons. They, they may not recognize that they are following after demons, but they are following after the lies, the doctrines, the teachings of these deceitful spirits. So this isn't, in these verses, talking about somebody struggling in their faith, but I'm going to talk about that as well. I have another friend, and, and again, I don't, I don't know the spiritual um, relationship or lack thereof between John and, and God or between this friend and God, but I know what it looks like on the outside. Um, she used to be a part of my life group uh, in another church in North Carolina. And sometime after we moved to Idaho, we saw on our Facebook uh, her, that she renounced her faith. And she began uh, talking badly on Facebook about, about the church. And, and not just the church that she attended, but the church at large. Um, she didn't block everybody, but we noticed that many of her church friends uh, that, that we attended with that she had blocked. Um, and I don't know the full story. Um, but I know that for a time she, she no longer claimed to be a Christian. And I know that today, uh, though probably still in need of some discipleship, she is a professing Christian again. Um, it's possible, again, I don't know, I don't know where she is. I, um, sadly, I haven't talked with her about this. But I know it's possible for a person, uh, to, as a Christian, to fall into such great error that maybe they can, for a time, turn away from, uh, from true faith in Christ. Um, Paul's talking about something deeper, and we're going to discuss that. Um, if you fall into such great error, I, I believe that if you are truly saved, and we'll talk about this, if you have truly been redeemed of your, of your sins, have been washed by Jesus, God holds on to you forever. So that's why I can say that if someone, whether it's my friend here or someone else, if someone turns completely away, but then God can restore them. And if they belong to God, God will restore them. But what Paul is talking about in these verses is apostasy. Um, I've used that word a few times. I think I've defined it. Just, just to be clear, it means leaving the faith. It means that I have uh, once declared that Jesus is my Savior, and now I would no longer be declaring that. Uh, the word, does the word describe a person who was a Christian, saved by grace, and then no longer, through, because of their sin, no longer was one of God's redeemed? I don't believe that is possible. Um, these are people that had the appearance of salvation, but never truly belonged to Christ. Uh, John talks about that in 1 John. I, I almost always come to 1 John when I'm discussing other passages where it talks about those leaving or departing. 1 John 2, starting in verse 18, very clearly talks about it. It says, children, it is the last hour. Remember, Paul said, in the latter days, this will happen. So even as early as when Jesus went up into heaven, 
we, we began living in the last days. He says, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. And here's the key. Verse 15, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would not have continued. That, sorry, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all the knowledge. If we have been anointed by the Holy One, we truly belong to the us that John is talking about, to the, to the church, and God's people, God's redeemed. But these people that have left, they are people that went out from us, departed, just like Paul said. And we know that they were not part of the true church. And how do we know? In the words of John, if they had been with us, they would have continued with us in the faith. It's like Matt shared with us last week about the beauty of God's sovereignty, God's control, God's choice in salvation. I believe God is in control of all things, even that salvation. Uh, and that, can, that should give us, if we think about it, that should give us a, a very strong hope. I used to just hear it described this way, once saved, always saved. Uh, the, the Bible tells us, Jesus said that of all that the Father has given me, that he loses not one. First Peter here, verses 3 through 5, gives us that same security. First Peter, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. We did not cause ourselves to be born again. He has caused us to be born again. To what? To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable. It will not perish. It is undefiled. It can't be stained. It is unfading. In fact, it is kept in heaven for you. And, and ask yourself, what does it say? How is it, how is it kept in heaven? Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now let, me, let me be clear. This is not a license to go out and sin. But God has redeemed us. And yes, as Christians, we do still sin. And when we do, we need to go to God in repentance and ask Him to forgive us of our sins. And yet the truth is that all of our sins, future, past, have, have been washed away. Think about it, when Jesus died on the cross, all of your sins and my sins were, at that point, future sins. And yet he says it is finished at that point. It's God's power that's guarding us through faith for salvation. And even though sin is wicked and it separates us from God, since it is God's power protecting my salvation, there's no, I am not strong enough to overcome God's power. So, again, I keep on wanting to make it clear, I do not pretend to know the exact spiritual state of these two examples. My friend that fell into error and seemingly renounced Christ then returned to the faith, if she is sincere in that and has called on the name of the Lord and believed in Jesus and Jesus alone, his sacrificial death on the cross for us and resurrection, she was saved. And even in error, her salvation is secure. My youth pastor, who again, I, I haven't heard from him in years. I, who, who, for all we know, maybe he has returned to the faith. I, I don't know. But with the information at hand, he renounced his wife, he renounces God, he renounced Jesus and his church, and as far as I know, never returned. That would be described by this passage here today. He went out from us to show us that he was not a part of us. So what does that mean for us as believers? Well, first we need to recognize that we are in a spiritual battle. And that battle is for the truth. And that truth is defined in the pages of God's Word. Now, our senses can be deceived. Uh, we, we, and our thoughts can be incorrect. Uh, we have no hope of knowing anything, even knowing what is real, even knowing if this pulpit here is real, or this person standing before you is real, apart from a God who has revealed himself to us, which he has in the pages of his Word. And we see, and we will see, that the battle takes place through the teaching, through doctrine. It takes place in our minds and in our hearts. That's why this, the church needs to uphold truth. As we do that, as we uphold truth, a spiritual struggle in our lives and in our church takes place. 
And I, I wrote here, guess where the battle is? I already told you. It's in our, it's our hearts, no, hearts and our minds. 2 Corinthians verse 10, 3 through 6, Paul talks about that. Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Strongholds of thought. I know that because verse 5 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion, arguments and opinions, um, which seems to be all that the, the world has. And remember, as we're looking at the lies of the world, we have been told in uh, Timothy, and we'll be told here in James in a moment, that these lies and, and deceits and arguments come from, come from demons. Um, I threw that in for, for free. Let me, let me back up. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. And so the church stands against these invalid arguments, these lofty opinions of man, which the Bible tells us are raised against the knowledge of God. How much is it that we hear from the world that would destroy, uh, would try to destroy the knowledge and the truth of the Bible? We need to keep our thoughts on what is good and godly. In verse 5, uh, back in Timothy, no, sorry, verse 5 here in Corinthians tells us to take every thought captive to Christ so that we are not led astray by the deceit and the falsehoods and the error of the enemy. That's why the Bible is so vital to understand truth. We have, as I said, an eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing God who has revealed himself to us in these pages of the Word. And what kind of opinions, arguments, what, what kind of thoughts can creep in well, the world is full of, earth, of worldly wisdom, and 1 Timothy 4.3 specifically tells us some of the errors. This is not a complete list, uh, clearly. But some of the errors that were uh, rampant in the church there was the people forbidding marriage, it tells us in verse 3, forbidding eating certain foods. This is an idea called asceticism. And if you can't pronounce that, it's okay. Probably I can't either. Um, it's an idea... That self-denial makes us in, somehow, some, in some way holy. Uh, that if you don't eat donuts, maybe you're more holy than the person that does. Uh, what it is, is a denial of grace. And I can, I can show you uh, whether it's forbidding marriage, forbidding certain foods, um, as a spiritual means, I can show you that that is denying grace with simple math. Um, Let's do some, I, I almost never do this from the pulpit. Let's do some audience participation. What is one plus one? What does one plus one equal? Zero. Very close. It equals not one. And yes, it's just two, of course. One plus one does not equal one. Grace plus anything else does not equal grace. When I add something to the grace of God is necessary for my holiness, my righteousness, or my salvation, I'm destroying Grace is. Well, what grace is? I'm going to borrow from some of Matt's thoughts on this text. At one point, he was going to preach this passage, and he was gracious enough to send me some of his notes that he had written. <clears throat> I like how he said it. He said, the devil does not care which lie you believe. You can be a Mormon. Excuse me. <clears throat> you can be a Mormon. You can be a Scientologist. You can be a liberal Christian who doesn't believe in hell or thinks that gay marriage is okay. You can be an atheist. You can be agnostic. Um, you can be this ascetic that was in the, Ephesus, the church of Ephesus who thinks that by staying single and not eating bacon makes you holier than everyone else. Uh, I'm not going to go to Acts where we get the permission to eat bacon, but I'm so happy for that, for that passage. Seemingly small things, like in verse 3, marriage and food, are the beginnings of introducing lies and errors into our hearts and our minds. And eventually you can go one of two ways, depending on the true nature of your relationship, of your relationship with God. I mean, be clear, if you are truly one of God's children, if, if he has uh, redeemed you, you are fully redeemed. And so uh, falling into apostasy is not an issue for you. But the, how, how do we know that we are fully redeemed? By by following and trusting in him and, and him alone. And because of that, we know that we will continue in the faith, even if we, if, we, if we move into error. But we can move into error so, so, so badly that we, uh, 
we waste years of our lives maybe leading other people astray, um, hurting our, our family and our friends, um, hurting the church by proclaiming lies instead of truth. It's, it's important to keep our eyes on truth. Either way, you're going to either become a, you could become a fully deceived believer like my friend that I mentioned who later returned to her faith, or if you had never believed, be like the one who departed and never returned. Neither is a good option for us. And either way, every lie that the enemy can get us to believe, even the small ones, maybe even especially the small ones, they are one step closer to not believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that you were born a sinner, that you were dead in your sin, and that by believing in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, you can be saved. These thoughts that don't line up with Scripture, where do they come from? I've told you a couple times. They're demonic. The book of James tells us that. James 3, 14 and 15 tells us, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Our passage here in Timothy Paul says that these thoughts come from deceitful spirits and the teachings or the doctrines of demons as well. Embracing sinfulness is good. Uh, I have this written down. I think this is another thought from Matt. Embracing sinfulness is good, whether it's homosexuality, transgenderism, or lying, cheating, leaving your spouse. If the wisdom does not align with Scripture, it's demonic, and we need to depart from it. That's why we preach... This is the fault from that. <laughs> I try to be careful to, 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 to when, I'm not, when I'm quoting you, to give you uh, the right uh, appreciation for that. This is why we preach expositorily through the Bible. Like, like he shared last week, we read and explain, read and explain. Read Scripture, go to the source, study it, understand it, and make it clear to the congregation. This helps prevent us from turning to legalism and added rules that would destroy grace like we have here in this third verse of Timothy. The specific lies that Paul deals about here are very specific things, but the principle here is not just, it's not even about marriage or food. It's about not adding to the Word of God. Verses 4 and 5 tells us for everything that's created, created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. So everything created by God is not to be rejected if we receive it with thanks. This is is a reason that we say blessings before meals. So we don't have to abstain from certain foods, certainly not for religious reasons, certainly not because we we think it makes us holy or accepted by God. So yes, okay, if, if you don't want to gain too much weight, grow unhealthy, Maybe abstain from donuts at least time time from time. But don't do it because we think that it makes us right in God's eyes. Titus, the book of Titus, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, Paul writes, To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciousnesses are defiled. They profess to know God, But they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. We can profess to know God, as we see here, but if we are clinging to uh, these other ways of bringing about righteousness in our lives that aren't from God, um, we're denying him, and we're not fit for the good work that God would have us do. So in Timothy, what we see here is that what God has called good, what God has made good, is good. Enjoy it. Be thankful for it. Praise God for it. And then with that, we move into verse 6 and hopefully into some encouragement. Um, We see the life of a good servant. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 6. Uh, As we move to that, it just struck me that we need more than just information in our walk with Christ. I've just now given us a whole lot of information about what it means when people fall away. Um, why we need to be guarded against that. But information is not always enough. Sometimes we need encouragement. We need a motivation. And starting here in verse 6, that's what Paul is doing. 
He tells us, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. That's the ultimate blessing. One, one day to hear from our Lord, well done, good and faithful servant. And these, in these verses, these are the characteristics, some of the characteristics, I should say, of what a good servant is and does. Now, these verses are addressed to Timothy, who was an elder, a minister. But every quality that he is sharing with Timothy also has an application to us, every single child of God. So every member of the church, every father, mother, child, if you're a believer in Christ, these are applicable to us. And it starts with truth. Um, a good servant, whether a pastor or not, or not, shares truth. So I would encourage you in your walk to uh, continue through the pages of the Word, continue to, to love truth and to share truth with one another. You glance down through this passage, and I'm not going to read these verses, but, but if you glance down through it, you'll see how important teaching is to this, to this section, to being a good servant. Uh, verse 6, Paul talks about good doctrine, which is the teaching of the church. In verse 7, he warns about false teaching. Verse 11, he tells Timothy to command and teach these things that he has just been sharing. Verse 12 tells Timothy to set an example in his speech, in his words, the words of, of what? Of truth, of teaching. Verse 13, he says, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture in exhortation, in teaching, to teaching. Verse 14, he tells Timothy not to neglect his gift. And his gift was that of teaching and preaching and shepherding. In verse 16, he tells him to keep a close watch on himself and on the teaching. Truth, the truth of the scripture is paramount for us here. To do this and to do this as effective servants, it requires a belief in us that the word of God is enough through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Let's never be a people that say, yeah, I know the Bible says this, but nothing good comes after that part of that sentence. I believe in what the, the word of God says and what the Bible says. Elders and preachers, yes, this applies to them, but also to all of us, to all the brothers and sisters growing together in Christ. We're told to share, we're commanded to share and learn and teach God's word in faith. Paul says to Timothy to put these things before the brothers, to point them out to the church. He wants Timothy to protect the church from error and falsehood. He says, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. We do this from the pulpit, but we also do this through discipleship, through one-on-ones. At some point, as we grow in our church, uh, perhaps through classes and groups, uh, reading the Bible together, this is what a good servant does. And we can be good servants by applying this to our lives. A good servant shares the truth from God's word. He protects God's people from lies and falsehood. Verses 7 and 8, a good servant puts aside silly myths. Tells us to have nothing to do with them. No irrever irrever irreverent, no bad teaching. No silly myths. This literally means old wives' fables. So it's a way of saying, stay away from teachings that have no value. Don't, don't, don't go near teachings that the old women might sit around and talk about. Now, I didn't say that. That's the Bible. Um, thank you for laughing at one person. Um, instead of that... A good servant trains for godliness. Paul is picking up what he wrote in the first chapter. Uh, if it, I'm going to read it, and you, you're going to see how similar this sounds. In the first chapter, he warned about false teachers. Same idea, 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 7. Paul said, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may cha charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor to devote themselves, here it is, to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. So we are not to swerve away from the truth. We are not to be given to vain discussions, false opinions. We are to train and be trained in the truth, in faith, 
setting aside the empty opinions of men. So a good, a good servant separates himself from error. It didn't matter how well Timothy was taught. Timothy knew God. He knew Jesus. He, he was disciple. Can you imagine? He was discipled by Paul himself. But yet Paul tells him, have nothing to do with these teachings. So we can't think that putting ourselves under diseased teaching from demons will not have a spiritual effect on us. We're not called to be experts in what's wrong. We're called to know what God has said is true and right. We're to be grounded in that. Now, I don't think Paul is saying here, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying here that there's no value in understanding some of the errors that we're trying to expose. There, there are other passages that tell us to uh, be ready to give a defense for the gospel, and you can do that effectively when you know what the other side is saying, but you can spend so much time concentrating on, on the wrong that you lose sight of what is right. And, and it, like I said, it affects you spiritually. I'll, I'll give you an example. I lived down in Florida and, uh, in an area where the Mormon church was prominent. Um, so prominent, um, I had people tell me, well, you can't tell me that, the, that you know, my, my sister, my mother, wh- whoever in the Mormon church, you can't tell me that they don't know Jesus. Um, and, and I would tell them, I don't know who, why they believe, but if they believe what the Mormon church teaches, then no, that is not the, the Jesus of the Bible. And, and it grieved me that so many people were falling into that error. Um, it, it, this particular church is, uh, or, or, faith, or faith, false religion, cult, whatever you want to call it, it, it uses very similar, sometimes identical terminology to mean completely different things. They, they'll tell us, well, we believe in Jesus. We believe in grace. We believe in all these things. We just mean different things than what the Bible means by them. Um, they purposefully prey on and deceive churchgoers with those similarities in the terminology, in the words. And I wanted to be more effective in sharing and defending the gospel with them and with discipling church members who believe there was no difference, really, in what they said and what the Bible says. So I wanted to know what Mormons believed, and so I began to study it. And there can, again, be some value, but here's what happened with me. I began reading their writings. I read, I read much of the Book of Mormon, much of the, the, uh, what's called the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. These are their, uh, these are their scriptures. And while I was trying to be careful not to ground myself in what they believe, it it distracted, it took away from my Bible study. I was focusing on it too much. I was focusing too much on the false. And it began to feel oppressive in my mind, in my spirit. Um, it, I, was not, I was not drawn away into thinking, oh, maybe there's something here to what they're saying. But I can tell you, it, it hurt my relationship with God. So I had to turn away. And besides, whether it's Mormon or something else, We can't immerse ourselves in every single false teaching that the world uh, teaches. We can't study it all. Uh, Where would you start if you you had to learn everything that was incorrect and error in order to understand what the truth is? It's not how truth works. It's impossible, in fact, to know what's wrong without first knowing what is right. So we immerse ourselves in what the Bible says. Truth corrects error. And if you know what is true, then you will recognize the falsehood. And remember, the gospel is a positive message. You know, sometimes we have to stand up here. I've done it today uh, to, to some very small degree. We've done it in other sermons saying, this is wrong. Let me tell you what, uh, what the world does that is wrong. But if we are only standing up here and telling you, here are the things we don't believe, then what, what is it that we believe? The gospel is a positive message. It means what good news, right? So... We're not preaching the gospel when we only tell what we don't believe. We're preaching the gospel when we preach the gospel. That God is holy, that we are not. That we sin, and there is a penalty for sin, uh, which, is, which is death, spiritual destruction. And yet, God loves us so much that he gave us his son, Jesus, who was God himself, became a man, lived a perfect life, and died the death that we deserved on the cross. And three days later, he was raised from the dead, and that if we believe in him, if we confess him as our Lord, if we ask him to forgive us of our sins, he saves us. That's the gospel. Back to verses 7 and 8 in Timothy here. Paul uh, t- 
tells us um, in verse 8, For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. As it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Paul is not against exercise. We don't get out of it that easy. Uh, that's, that's training the body, getting healthy. It has, as he says, some value. Another way to look at that would be it has limited value. It's good, but it's not the most important thing. So yes, you can live longer, look better, have a higher quality of life with some physical training. Body health is important. But more important than that is godliness. Um, a temptation might be here to make the point, if I wanted to make the point strong enough that you know, Paul is not saying, don't worry about your health, don't worry about your body. I, I could go to 1 Corinthians 6 where he talks about, uh, descri- he describes the body as the temple, but that's out of context. Um, uh, but actually, if we do go to 1 Corinthians 6, we're going to see Paul's point about godliness being more important uh, being made. You see, our physical bodies, while important, they're all we have here in this particular life, physically, they're temporary. Unless Christ returns during our lifetimes, everyone here at one, uh, one day will die. I'm sorry I know that I said this would be encouraging, but it's true. Um, the verse, the, ver- the passage in 1 Corinthians where it calls the body a temple is actually warning us not about... Um, making sure that we're as healthy as we need to be, it's warning about our spiritual condition. We can read this in light of Paul's earlier instructions about not abstaining from foods for religious reasons. With all that, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 12, says, All things are lawful for me. I can eat what I want to eat, right? But not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. Both our stomach and our food will pass away, right? He tells us the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. He goes on to tell us to flee from sexual immorality, and that is the context of the body being a temple. And then in verse 20, uh, he'll go on to say, so glorify God in your body. So our bodies are important, but they, they pale in significance to our spirit, to our soul. The body perishes, the spirit does not. Our bodies are compared to seeds in Scripture, and it's a beautiful picture also in Corinthians, showing us that what, what happens at the resurrection. So a seed, if you understand it, is broken apart. A seed dies, and then out of it comes something that is much greater. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44, te- picks up that thought where it's been talking about the seed that is the body dying. He says, so it, is, so, it is, so is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. That's the bodies we have now. It is raised a spiritual body. So one day we will have a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, Paul says, there is also a spiritual body. And it is this spiritual nature that Paul is concerned with back in Timothy. Godliness, while physical training is of some value, of limited value, godliness is of value in every way. Why? It holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This isn't something where... If you practice godliness, if you allow God to to work and have his way in your life, uh, then in eternity uh, there will be great blessing from that. That's true. There's great blessing today for that as well. It has value in every way. Not just our eternity, but our todays and tomorrows as well. God does not reward us based off of how fit we are. And for some that may be better news than others. But God does value the godliness that is in our life more than anything else that we do in, the, in, in our physical bodies. So a good servant, bringing this back to the idea of a servant, a good servant is spiritually disciplined. Physical training means work, right? Spiritual training does as well. We're dependent on God for that, but at the, uh, we're dependent on God for everything, but at the same time we work. And we find in our passage today... <clears throat> 
that will be confronted by false teaching. It's deceptive, and it's even easy sometimes for Christians to be led astray. We need to remember that the spiritual battle we face is in our hearts and our minds and turn to the word for guidance and disciple and fellowship with one another, which brings us to verses 9 and 11. Here in Timothy, where he tells us, the saying is trustworthy <clears throat> and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hopes set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe, command, and teach these things. Teach these things, Paul says to Timothy, that he has been writing about to this point. We work for the Lord with our hope, it says, set on Christ. Hope in the Bible is not, man, I sure hope that, that, that it's true that Jesus lives. Hope is um, it's our security. Our, our hope as Christians is that we know that Jesus is the Son of God and has forgiven us from our sins. He's our hope. He's also our purpose, our Lord. He's our Lamb. He's our reason for everything that we do where He should be. And we cannot be faithful servants of, of God if we aren't raised in the Word, if we don't share it, if we don't uh, share the truth, know the truth, understand the truth, but also work in the godliness that the truth has called us to, having good hearts. If we train ourselves in godliness, if we set our hopes on Christ, well, what does that look like? We'll, we'll end with this here. It's going to look like loving God, loving His people, loving His Word, evaluating everything that we come into contact with, every thought, every opinion, in light of what does, what does the Bible say. Reading it, trusting in it. Sometimes reading the Bible is hard. Sometimes that's the easy thing because it means prayer. I think sometimes it's easier to study the Bible than to set time aside and, and pray to God. But that's, that's what a servant does. Have a servant's heart. Serve and love one another like we're hearing uh, so many people in the church are, are, are pitching in and doing. So this is encouragement. That, th these are some things I see in, in, in many of us. Share God's truth. God didn't save us so that we would never tell anybody about Jesus. In fact, he's, he's commanded us to share this good news with other people. Stand for truth. That's what a good servant is. That's what a good servant does. If we do these things and we do it with our hope set on Christ, we will not depart from the truth. We'll be protected from error. We'll grow in godliness and we will be God's good servants. As we remember that God has called us to do that, as we have believed and trusted in his son alone for our salvation, we have a reason to be joyful and a salvation, as we've learned, that can never fade away. <coughs> With that, we're going to come up and sing blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Let's stand.
Close with our benediction today it comes from Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us, that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed.